This is Crewcast, a podcast about the most infamous band in rock history. Your resident crew head, Jason, here with you. Thank you for listening to the podcast. If it's the first time, please hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. Of course, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get it. And give us a follow on social media. It's Crewcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Welcoming to uh, Crewcast, the one and only Todd Junker. How you doing, my brother? I'm very good. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm excellent, man. Of course, you are a busy guy. You are out there doing uh, Vince's gear, of course, for the stadium tour, which it it looks awesome. And I want to dig into some of that stuff, uh, you know, how you came up with the design, because I really dig like the Japanese motif look and everything that you have on it. But uh, I want to know more about Todd. Like, how did you even get into this work? My understanding is uh, you were doing some stuff and Lenny Kravitz, who I, I just dig that dude was one of your first clients yeah yeah it's totally bizarre so i think uh, i mostly like have been singing in like punk bands and stuff yeah when i was growing up so then i moved to la and i couldn't find any like leather pants that i like that's like around 2001 some sometime around there and i met this girl and her company was called um new york city custom leather okay and she's badass so she showed me me like how to start doing stuff like basic patterns and all that and so it kind of started from there and and i didn't even have the money to buy a machine so everything that i was kind of working on was left at her house and that's how lenny kravitz the the stylist that works for lenny kravitz saw the junker stuff that i was doing that's rad so did you uh what different stuff did you do because if i remember that time he's wearing a lot of cool fringe stuff and things of that nature if i'm recollecting yeah. I never, I never saw a picture of him in anything that I made. At really? that time, I was making, um, I was taking like jeans and and overalls and tearing them apart and turning it into like vests and over dyeing it. And then I was putting this this shiny kind of nineteen seventies looking cobra, big cobra print on the back of everything I did. So I think it was like kind of three variations of that with like big cobras on the back. That's rad. Yeah. Were you were you just kind of like uh, always a pretty inquisitive like kid? Because, you know, you're pretty heavily tattooed. I know for me, I was, you know, always doodling or something, um, right. you know, a dreamer. I, I, I also read we have something in common. We're both Star Wars fans, or at least that oh, had an yeah. impact on us as a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I've always been into that stuff, you know, like usually when I tell people like, you know, I, I grew up like right at the magical time for like uh, Kiss and uh, Star Wars, you know, to kind of like melt my mind, like as a, as a kid, you know, like you're seven, eight around there. And I was just like, wow, you know, and it just kind of like, you know, changes you forever, you know? Yeah. I mean, it really was. It was so gnarly. I, I you know. I look at my kids and I'm like, God, you guys are a little spoiled and stuff. But when we saw stuff like Star Wars, and it's funny you mentioned Kiss, uh, you remember like the Trapper Keeper binders? I got, yeah, tra- I still have my Darth Vader one. Do you? Oh, that's badass. I, yeah. But I, I got in trouble because I, I had one of the inserts and it was, it was Kiss, I want to say alive too. And whatever reason, the teacher was all pissed off about it. Like, don't you know what Kiss means? Right. Was that the nice and Satan service? Thing? Yeah. Or, yeah. It was when, when, when stuff could still be gnarly. Yeah. I mean, cause God, it was so cool. Like growing up in the seventies and we would all hang out and, and, and draw and watch uh Saturday night live and stuff and, and make stuff. And we were making super eight films. And, and back then I just remembered it was like, I don't even know where the rumors came from, but it was like, no, Gene Simmons has like a cow tongue that was implanted <laughs> and they sewed it in there. That's why his tongue is so big. We're like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, like all. This, yeah. God, man, growing up in the 70s was awesome. Yeah, I was. Uh, well, I was born in 78, so I was kind of on the tail end. But but it right. was, you know, and like I've talked about on the this podcast, the gnarly thing for me was, you know, brother was a rock guy, drummer. 
all that. He had the Tommy Lee hair and leather pants and all that shit. Brad. And he got me into metal and, and really like shout at the devil was the most significant album for me as a kid. You know, my mom was into pop and, you know, right. stuff, stuff like uh, Bruce Springsteen. And I would sneak her Prince records and shit like that. Cause I was really, right, really right, still right. a huge Prince fan. But yeah, when I saw shout at the devil it's like, what is this? So there was still that gnarly, kind of yeah. pissing people off stuff going on whereas now it's eh. yeah that's pretty much what happened to me there's this guy greg that i grew up with and uh, i still remember like he brought shout of the devil to gym gym class the the record and so uh i was a, a freshman in high school and so by that time like i think we all were like eh, kiss is kind of whatever and then all of a sudden we saw this Motley Crue album. We like freaked, just freaked out. And I was playing drums then too. So I started playing drums. So I was listening to like a lot of Rush and Cheap Trick. And then I started hearing like the double bass stuff that Tommy was doing. And I was just like, oh man, this is killer. Yeah, I totally got into that record big time. Yeah. How did, uh, you know, kind of be, I mean, that's so cool. You had this group of people doing cool artsy stuff. How did you fit in in high school did you not fit in was it just kind of like <laughs> i gotta uh, be i'm here because i gotta be here yeah i mean i was doing a lot of like you know drinking and drugs and stuff back then mm. so like i didn't like you know obviously i didn't like being in high school i was getting into you know punk rock and stuff a lot more through high school i had a this uh, girlfriend where her mom would just let us stay over there and smoke pot and have sex and hang out and, you know, do acid and all this stuff. So like, you know, no one, people messed with me when I was in junior high, but the time I was in high school, like I was just like, I was like a punk and I was, I was barely at school. Like no one was going to do anything to me really. Right. It has a gnarly time for sure. Um, so like, at what point do you, I know you played it in some different punk bands and stuff like that. Uh, how long did you continue like your music career and, and what did you do up until 2001 when you came to LA? Um, well, music, I still do music, but uh, the, the band that broke up when I just said like, screw this. And I was like, you know, a friend was moving to LA and I just decided to help him drive the moving van. The 10 years prior to that, I was in this band called Spunk that was from Houston. And we were doing pretty good. We recorded some stuff with um, like uh, Rick Rubin brought us in to do like a, a, a I guess it would have been a demo. And that got all that got screwed up and we just toured a lot. And it was really great. Like that stuff was killer. And then when I then when I moved to. um uh, LA, I started another band called Die Fast. Mm. So Die Fast was the band I was trying to make cool leather pants. You know, I wanted to wear cool leather pants or whatever. So I was trying to make that that stuff. Um, and so I think Spunk did, uh, I think, three, three albums. And Die Fast, we have two albums. And then we have another album that's just sitting there. And I'm trying to figure out what to do with it right now nice it's like an ongoing like music is like you know i don't know anything about fashion it's all music related you know yeah well it's cool that that was the driving force for you and, and became a, a really killer outlet i mean you've yeah. I'll, yeah I'll ask you to run down some of the some of the people you've designed gear for here in a bit but um so you mentioned tommy here in the double bass did you stick with playing uh drums or have you moved to some other instruments or what, uh, what well, drums, so drums, I, I played in a couple bands and then pretty much spunk. I think that was 80, 1989 um, from playing drums in other bands. It was easier for me to find a drummer and make myself the singer. Because I couldn't find a singer that was going to do the stuff that I wanted to do. Like they weren't doing it. I was like, well, I know what I want. I think I could do it. And I know drummers. So what is flip that around i mean i still have a you know i have a big ludwig drum set in my house and all that and it's just like there's just not time to play it which is you know tragedy tragedy <laughs> yeah that's really interesting it, might, it reminds me of people like uh like soli erna from godsmack same kind of thing you know uh, everybody like why don't you sing you know what you want out of it so get up there and do it 
Right. That's funny. Like our, the guy that produced um, our records is the same guy that produces Godsmack stuff. Oh, no shit. Yeah. A guy named uh, Andrew Murdoch. OK. He, he, his name is uh, like Mudrock. It's like his I guess his producer name. So sure. He also did like the first three of Avenged Sevenfold records and he did the Eyes of Alice Cooper and then another Alice Cooper record. And he did, a, I think, a Power Man 5000 record. Oh, wow. And then he did the Die Fast record that's called um, Hollywood. And then he did the other one that's supposed to come out. That's uh, I think we're going to call it Creek or something like that. But yeah, he did all that stuff. That's gnarly. What was yeah, it? Cool. What was Rick Rubin like for you? Because, man, that was I mean, eons ago. And he's just a interesting, trippy dude. Yeah. I mean, I think we were like super dumb. Like we didn't, I had no idea what was going on. I knew who Rick Rubin was because he produced like Beastie Boys was the extent of like my knowledge. And at that time, um, the guys in the Red Hot Chili Peppers were kind of taking us around town and treating us nice and everything. Oh, right. On. And, uh, you know, he, he just showed up and, and we played a show at this place called Raji's. It was like downstairs in Hollywood. It eventually got smushed by an earthquake. But he came in there and, and I think he was barefoot, like he goes around barefoot everywhere. He showed up, he just kind of looked at us and then that was it. And there's a, this other dude named Jimmy who was working for Rick Rubin. And we went to the, this weird all black house and we, we recorded there. It was like hot. It was, it was, man, it was hot there. And um, we recorded it. And and I think what happened was um guyos guyo series or he he works for maverick i think he's a long time like i think he's signed to madonna oh, yeah. he's been around forever but um yeah i think i left him like a shitty voice message or something one day i can't even remember why and then i think that squashed like the deal <laughs> is what happened i'm trying to remember i think it was like well i think rick wants to sign us and blah you know Little did I know I'm such a dumbass. Rick is the producer and it probably would have been released through Guy. Right. You know, yeah, he, he had a probably a production deal through the record label, uh, Maverick, I think. And I was such an idiot. I thought there was like some bit, maybe like some bidding war or, or something. I knew like zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> well, it's a, it's an odd business, man. It's odd as right. a dude that, that did uh, radio for over 20 years. Before I left for some different projects, man, I, I never figured it out at all. Right. Well, you don't you don't do that. You know what I did. I think, you you know, if I would do it over again, you know, you have to have your lawyer, all that stuff you don't think about. Oh, I need a lawyer. Oh, I need to figure out like what what's going on. I need to ask well, what what are we fucking doing? Actually, you know, yeah. not like that. I'd be like, hey, well, you know, what's happening? Like, you know. I didn't even know what was going on exactly. But but really, if you think about it, that would be so anti-punk rock to be like, oh, hey, hold up, guys. We got to have a lawyer, you know? Right, right. But then at the same time, it's like if I would have been, you know, I don't know. That was so long ago. I actually wrote Rick Rubin a letter through uh, Instagram where I was just like, hey, I don't know if you remember, but. My ego and and big ego and zero knowledge. I apologize. You know, I wrote. I think I wrote. Um, what's his name? A letter to Guy O series. Yeah. Like la I think last year or this year. Let me ask you a question because you brought it up and I and I'd let you know the work I do. Otherwise, my other podcasts are in the area of mental health and addiction recovery. Did oh shit, red. Yeah, we might have to jump you on one of those and go more into that. But was the, you're talking about making amends, and immediately I'm right. like, I've written those letters. Did did you come to a point where where you had to confront the drug and alcohol abuse? Or yeah, use? I mean, I was lucky because my, my dad was sober. So, hmm. uh, yeah, I went through like rehab, you know, probably in 1980. God, I it, it was way back way back i went through rehab yeah. um and then yeah i went to like aa meetings for like almost straight for like four years and then now like i don't consider myself part of like the program anymore like i like i faded away from it and then when i went back for me i was just like this is it seemed too like churchy and culty for me sure 
And then like, I, you know, if you go to a lot of meetings, like I used to go to a ton of meetings, you always hear like that. Well, the person that doesn't go to meetings doesn't know what happens to the people that don't go to meetings. So like, I was like, huh. It's like, well, I don't know. I think I'm all right. I think I'm not saying I grew out of like addictive behavior because you, I don't think that you ever do like not by a long shot, but um, the part where I was drinking until I blacked out, I haven't had a drink since uh, June 10 of 1987. Mm. So I must've been in rehab in like 86 probably because I got, I was sober for like nine months and then relapsed, I believe. Is that the, I don't even know what the question was. <laughs> what was <laughs> that's that's what pretty was much it. <laughs> that was, no, I was curious. Uh, you, you know, you brought it up and as a, as a guy that's in recovery too, uh, you know, yeah. uh, I always got to see what little nugget of wisdom, but I agree with you. I have so many friends and people I've talked to on the, the knocking doors down podcast that I've done. I mean, shit, we've had Charlie Sheen on there and oh, all rad. kinds of people. Yeah. Nice. Uh, um, and then uh, I was going to, I think Nikki was going to come on, but it was just when they started rehearsal. So I'm going to wait till the tours end and follow up again. Um, oh, man. But yeah, it, it's, uh, I don't think there's one path. And I found that with some people that, that they have that same kind of struggle with some of the AA mentality too, where it, it yeah. can, come, can come across a little cultish and everything else. And I just think for me, it's like, I'm lucky I got a good sponsor. He's like, did you have a spiritual awakening? Yeah. Do you know what that, you know, what your quote unquote God is and for you who that higher power source, whatever you want to yeah. call it. I do. Cool. All right. You're going to do business for that. Now it's like, boom, it's, it's yeah. all needed. you know, and I, I'll go a couple months without a meeting and then I'll hit one just cause I want to catch up with some people and stuff like yeah. that. But, but I could see that being a deterrent for some people for sure. Yeah, dude, like alcohol is wicked, wicked evil. Man, <laughs> that oh. stuff is, it's, that's why it's legal because, man, it just annihilates people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, stuff like marijuana. I'm like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, please explain this. Please well, explain all of it, you know, somebody. Yeah. We could go into a whole deep thing about that, but it's not about that. I, you know, Oh yeah. So, yeah. Let's do like, yeah. I'd love to do the other show too. Yeah, sweet. Talk about all that stuff. Hell yeah. Yeah. Cause I'll go off on the whole fentanyl crisis and everything else, but oh, yeah, we'll save that for something else. Um, so you're starting to it's 2001 designer for Lenny Kravitz sees, uh, what you're doing. And yeah. when, do, when do we start really doing stuff for other people? Because I just dig what you said. I have no fashion background. I just started throwing stuff together because I wanted the look that yeah. I wanted. Well, once the Lenny Kravitz thing, it was uh, immediate. So to give you an idea, like how much of the deep end I, end, I, I, I ended up in, uh, in the first two years, I, I did uh, uh, Pink, uh, Shakira, Christina Aguilera, uh, Britney Spears. Like Whoa. in the first year. And I think I, um, you know, I have a sneaking suspicion. It's because the girl that showed me how to sew was like kind of tired with dealing with those pop stars. Maybe she was moving on to other things. I don't, I don't really know, but I, I can never figure out what happened that there was like such an avalanche of like business. Sure. And it was, it was crazy. So like I did all that, you know, and, and JC, chasse or whatever his name and Tara, Tara Reed. And then I did some costumes for the, the crow part four, you oh, know, wow. just like all kinds of weird Hollywood stuff. We were doing like a lot, started doing like a lot of fashion shows and, and just was cranking stuff out, you know, that's rad. Yeah. Four was the Edward Furlong one, right? If I remember correctly, yeah. crow. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I talked to him too. He was, he was cool as shit on my other podcast. I dug oh, that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I think David Borealis was in it and Tara Reed and uh, Danny Trejo. Oh, really? Yeah. I think he oh, had a small weird. part in that. Yeah. I still haven't talked to that cat. He's one of the guys on my list. He's just, oh, Danny. Yeah. yeah he's, he's killer. Like, yeah. His book was gnarly. I haven't read it. 
Oh, Tre- Treo, dude. It, yeah, if, you, if you're a reader or I do a lot of audio books because I drive a lot for work, it's like, I, oh, yeah, that's some gnarly shit. That's how I listened to 21, Nikki's latest book. I, he did a good job with the audio book on that. Oh, so. so did he do his own audio? Yep. Wow. Which I dug. I, I like when the author does it. That's It's pretty cool to hear it through his words and his recounting of it. Yeah, otherwise you're just... It's kind of like a cheapskate, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, it's, if it's a bio or, you know, biographical halfway, I think that the person needs to do it. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with you, dude. So, I mean, when do you start, you had a lot of these pop stars. When do we start getting more into the, the rock realm? I mean, cause you've done tons of metal people and everything else. Yeah, it's hard. It's man, it's really hard to remember because moved from Texas to LA and it just seemed like I worked nonstop for like 16 years, like just balls to the wall. But I do remember very specifically the first time I was going to make a pair of pants for Vince Neal. Yeah. And I, I don't remember how the job came about because I'd also done a bunch of stuff for Steven Tyler. And so my name probably got kicked around somewhere. And I uh, and uh, so I used to be in this really crazy like crack hotel in uh, Hollywood. It was supposed to be like an artist up and coming art hotel, something, you know, like conceptual. It, anyway, there's like blood on the walls and it was just Gidget Gein lived there. You remember that the, he played in Marilyn Manson? Yeah, yeah. So he he was my neighbor. And yeah, it was good times. But so then uh, I guess that it was probably around. I would. It it was oh man, I'm trying to think what tour that was. I don't know. We need some really like some Motley Crew heads on here to figure out the timeline. But the first time I did stuff for Vince, they sent me the pants uh, FedEx. I opened the, the pants and dude, we it was just rock and roll pants. Yeah, and I found out that Vince doesn't like to wash his stuff. <laughs> um, they just they just um, dry them, which oh, is okay. how his pants on the recent tour got stolen. I think in like North Carolina, he had a pair of pants stolen. Oh shit! Yeah, they like you know they were attached to one of those like those big like a tumble blower. Yeah, yeah. On the floor, and they kind of like clip them on there to to dry them out. Someone just stole his pants. That's screwed up, man. Yeah. But I hate was, thieves, but yeah, yeah. But I remember uh I think it's on Shot of the Devil. There I think there's a liner note somewhere about squishy sounds or something on one of the Motley Crue records where I was just like, were they screwing groupies and they recorded <laughs> part of it? And like, where is it? I and I don't know if I made this up or not. But anyway, so when I got those pants, I was like, I was like, there's like the tears of a thousand groupies all over these pants. This is like rock and roll, super sweat. This is like fucking, this is Vince Neal's pants, man. Like I was just, I was just tripping out, <laughs> tripping out. And then, uh, and then, you know, I made them uh, like some black jeans. And I think the first stuff I made them was um, black jeans with skulls on the knees. And then I believe a white leather vest and then a red leather vest um, where I did the, the big, the pentagram really big. And it said, fuck off on the back. Yeah. And I remember because Vince like was not so much into the pentagram stuff. So I think we got away with kind of doing that one thing. And then after that, like we don't do the pentagram really anymore. How do you so work? That was- how do you work with them with, with the designs? Did you get some instruction and then, you know, what he's into and what the vibe he wants for maybe the stage set? Cause I think the first stuff you did was, if I remember, I'm trying to picture that. Was it the red, white and crew tour when they got back together or was it the tour after? Maybe it's what red, red, Wait, when was Carnival of Sins or something? Yeah, I'm t- uh, dude. It's I'm like, it's right around this. in there somewhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because um, because I've worked for every guy in that band. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the uh, 
what is it? The Saints of Los Angeles promo pictures. Like I made the that Nikki jacket, the white one. Oh, that's rad. Okay. And then I made the Mick Mars jacket that has all those giant kilt pins in it. And then we did some other promo where Tommy was wearing some shirts and like a uh, a butt flap, bum flap thing I made. And I've done pants for Mick. But um, every one of the guys has been like super easy to work with. And uh, I think, you know, Nikki and, and Vince, probably from just being in the business for so long, they don't, it's never like a long explanation of something. Sure. So, you know, like I think stuff is like, yeah, like dirty bikerish, but all denim, you know, was one thing that he said. And, and we did that. And that was all the stuff that was the um, Kiss Motley Crue co headlining tour, tour that started like in Australia. Yeah. Remember those directions really specifically. We were going to make really dirty black, gray biker denim stuff for that tour. And then I remember when we did all the stuff for. Uh, Las Vegas, he's just like, you know, rock and roll Liberace, you know, and it's like, <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> he's like feathers and, all, you know, every, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, and, it, and that was super cool. Yeah. And then for this last tour, because it's like a, a, a the full concept, you know, is this, uh, you know, Neo Tokyo or, or, crazy asian asian influenced weird motley world that that yeah. we're in i guess you know yeah so they have like the cool kind of the guy with the oni mask have you seen that so yeah i've like, seen some of the videos yeah yeah so there's that guy and then they made up all the kanji the i call it like you know kanji crew or crew kanji so they made up all their own stuff um so that was the two words I heard was first from Vince was like, you know, you know, I want to wear a kimono. And then I was like, okay, that's awesome. Like that's totally out of left field. And then I started thinking about the, you know, the rush 2112 record. And I was like, kimonos are awesome. And then, uh, as I got talking to Nikki more, I started, uh, he was able to show me on his phone, like the, the different graphics. He's like, this is the kind of shit we're doing. Like we got this, this head thing and it's like static and there's going to be like staticky TVs and it's kind of like, you know, post apocalyptic -y kind of, you know, and um, that just helped kind of with all the ideas, like the junker stuff is already like, you no, know, you know, uh, mostly dirty anyway. Right. Yeah. So I think the decision was made on this tour was like, not, we don't want to do dirty greaser, nasty like biker stuff but we're gonna make stuff that has like a little bit of aging on it but it's it's probably like the least aged stuff that we've done i think yeah it's gnarly that I, that's one of the things that i've always loved about being a crew fan and just big rock shows in general as a guy with a theater background and film and television all that right. stuff that's the shit i went to college for to me, I just love the creativity of the production. It's it's one of the things like the the farewell tour that was sat front row when they were here. I live it near Fresno. And okay. man, I was just in awe of the overall production. Like people at the end, like, what was your favorite thing? Well, I love the way they did the lights, the pyro, the costume in this one. Nikki had the cool, you know uh military hat that, that you know i remember he wore the way back when where it had the skull and crossbones on it and right you know all that shit and i just right. dig like all that stuff how the whole entire vibe of it and the production and how it just it has a brilliant way of wrapping around uh, an overall encompassing like here's the presentation it's gnarly right 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 yeah and i work on film and stuff in in texas as well so it's it's uh you just realize like how many people it takes, you know? Yeah. I have the, the you know, the, there, there has to be the guy that makes the kanji crew. Okay. So there's that dude. Then there's the guy that's got to make the videos. There's a the guy that's got to uh, do the effects. Then the guy that like, has got to show the videos. And there's the tech that has to run the videos guy to make sure the led screens work. And then that's just that. Then you got like the pyro guys. And I'm just like, God, it's, it is like a film. Like there's hundreds and hundreds of people. And if something goes like a little haywire, I mean, you, someone can get hurt like really bad, just like on a movie. Someone can get killed. Yeah. 
So like when I think, you know, when I see these big shows, big shows like that, I'm like, man, some, you know, one person forgets to do one thing and some light falls down or something and man, you got problems. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, it's major. Yeah. One of my, my, I God, I don't even know how many times I've seen the crew now, maybe 20 something. Um, but I saw them when it was red, white and crew and they played a uh, weenie roast there in LA for K rock. And, okay. uh, I'm with the guy that's with management. I got tickets through, I think Alan Kovac at the time. And, uh, and he's like, uh, I'm a little worried. Why? Well, they got a new sound guy and that new sound guy fucked it up bad. And, you know, people take that stuff for granted, uh, you know, and yeah, yeah it's, it's, I always think back to, uh, uh, I think it was, I think it was white zombie on like the MTV awards where they couldn't use their own sound guy. Right. So they had right. to use like a, a tech from MTV and he st started like the loop tape, like in the wrong place so like you can hear the drum beats are off and it, it was just like oh my god someone's running the tape in the wrong place <laughs> oh yeah let's screw this up hey, yeah do, so you do film in texas yeah you done anything with william kaufman does that name ring a bell no i'm almost only work for robert rodriguez no Love shit it. yeah that just gave me the chills that is robert is my favorite director of all time he was really my, he would him and George Lucas, as far as directors, my two biggest influences. When I did uh, my first student film, um, I cut the same style that he did. I just uh, I was just doing stuff oh, in high school. Yeah. yeah, did it on, <laughs> on tape to tape, quick cuts, yeah. multiple angles of the same like stuff over and over. And then right. when I got my degree, I did a, a movie that was a, a spoof on the usual suspects. But a bunch okay. of DJs somehow put Wolfman Jack back on air. So the FCC is investigating them. And I, <laughs> uh, and I did it in his style. I got, I got first place to student film awards. And everybody's like pissed at me because I shot and edited it in two days. And it was a 12-minute movie. So I totally went in with his style of just let, oh, let, wow. let's get the shots and here wow. it is. Keep the camera rolling. Don't worry about it. Move it. You know, so that yeah. is gnarly. Yeah. So, yeah, he was buying like junker jackets a long time ago. And then it took some like, you know, snooping and uh, the ex business partner had like knew someone who knew the makeup girl of Jessica uh, of uh, Jessica Alba and called her up and then was pressing her for info. And she's like, oh, hold on. I'm working on a film with Robert. They're working on, I think, Sin City yeah. or something. Yep something there and she and she's like hold on hey robert you know the the guys in uh junker want your number and stuff is that cool i like, will send him an email and then yeah he sent sent it sent an email and so made him a bunch of jackets and then i just started bugging him you know about doing movie stuff that's gnarly what uh what stuff have you worked on with them you've done some gear um so with robert i did uh Uh, Machete 2. I did all the twos of everything. I did Machete 2, uh, Sin City 2. I worked on uh, Dust Till Dawn, the TV series, season two. Right on. And then I did uh, We uh, Alita, Battle Angel, and We Could Be Heroes. And there might be something else in there I'm forgetting. Dude, that's yeah, annoying. Lita was killer. Like the the guy, the main guy's wearing like a junker jacket. Hugo. Oh shit! Yeah, I still haven't watched my girlfriend and I. It's one of the things that we have earmarked, and I'm gonna have to watch it from a different perspective. Oh, dude, yeah, I'm acting in the end. You can see me playing a crazed cyborg. No shit. Yeah. That's yeah, I love, dude. Man, I was in I was in RoboCop two and Alita, and I, and I always play like play like a scowling fucking robot. <laughs> How did you get RoboCop two? Now I gotta. I love those. Well, okay, RoboCop three was shit. We gotta be honest, but one and two were badass. Oh man, I thought. Oh yeah, part two I didn't like, but anyway, so they but they filmed it in Houston. Oh really? Yeah. 
So, so how did you get that like, role? Well, they were just like, hey, man, it, it was just an extra role. Yeah. But I think because I was like, uh, I think because I had a lot of tattoos, I had dreads then. I was wearing some weird like neon yellow tank top. They're like, put that guy in the front. So I was just like in the front of this scene where a Robocop walks into like this arcade and I'm just like, <laughs> like scowling. <laughs> And I pretty much do the same thing in, in uh, Alita. I'm scowling and then I shoot like a fireball out of my arm and do some stuff. Oh, uh, awesome. That is pretty awesome, man. That's a trip. But life, yeah. life is weird that way, isn't it? Like, you know, if yeah. you could jump back to like a 18 year old you or something and go, dude, it's going to work out. It's going to be kind of cool. Just chill right. the fuck out. Right. If I could be like, hey, you're going to be in a uh, Cine Fantastique magazine. Yeah, yeah I've seen that film magazine. I grew up on that magazine. It's a special effects mag. And I grew up on that magazine. I was just like, oh, so into it. And then now I'm in that magazine. Like a you know, three or four really good pictures of me, like you know, wearing the gray pajamas with the balls on them and stuff. Yeah, that's and that was a big trip. Big trip. Yeah, what would you say out of your career so far is kind of one of the coolest moments? Would you say that was? Well, I think the moment that I always remember is uh, uh, th there's a few, but the first moment when it seemed like really big was when I saw um, Motley Crue in Anaheim and I could see Vince Neil on the Jumbotron and I could see the red vest, the red leather vest that said fuck off in the jeans. And I was just like, I was like, this is weird. This is crazy. This is the band that I was learning the drum part. So, you know, after I dropped some acid at my house, <laughs> this is the gr album, you know, that Greg turned me on to. This was like the album that got us all off kiss, you know, shout of the devil. Yeah. It was super crazy. Super that, crazy. That's gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. We'll have to maybe do another one down the line. I'll have a uh, dude that uh, I was telling you about Jesse that did Vince's guitar, his acoustic yeah. for the tour. And I believe he did it for the final tour as well um or the farewell but um yeah get on and, and talk about because he had kind of a similar thing he's just a motley crew like he's got another page that's motley crew museum and it's all these collectibles he has he's got a storage facility full of them and i think i wrote him like i like because i'm i have a bunch of like vince neal sketches i'm selling and all that like all the all the costume design stuff i mm. have I, 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 cause I've been moving and I work back and forth between LA and, and Texas. And I eventually found where I put all my sketches. I kind of didn't remember. So I've been cataloging everything in, in Texas now. And then all that stuff I'm, I'm selling, but it's all the stuff. Like when Vince has an idea, like I do two or three like pencil drawings and send him all the stuff because, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a Motley Crue fan. But at the same time, I'm like, how long am I going to hold on to my own like artwork? It seems yeah. like a little weird. Like I already drew it, you know, yeah. someone else could probably like enjoy it, I guess, you know? Yeah, I do. I, I, I it's funny. We've been talking about kiss as well. My, um, when I got my photography degree, I took all my friends, painted them up each, like a member of kiss had four of my friends. Then I did black and white portrait photos and stuff. And then the final, uh, it was like, I did, I made sure that it was 13 different photos. And then the final one is me in the middle with the amalgam makeup of all of them. And, uh -huh. and people are like, you tell me about it. Where's the photo? I go, I, I don't know. I hope my friends still have it. It's like, I, I did. Oh, you what know, the amalgam foot? What is that? Like off rock and rolled over. It has that the four face mashup. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that ass yeah. album cover, man. I love oh it. yeah, it was. And that's one of the things. Oh, that... hey, hold on. Yeah, hold go on. for it. Trip out. All right, to a little a little backstory. All right. So when I was growing up, and I and see, I don't know what the disconnect was. Like, I don't know if I was retarded. Like <laughs> most of the time when I was younger. But I didn't realize like you could buy like kiss shirts 
And so when I was growing up, like when I was eight, this guy gave me all these Frank Zappa records. So I spent time drawing my own like Frank Zappa T-shirts, my own Kiss T-shirts, my own Dead Boys T-shirts. And this is ancient. Let me see if there I think maybe there's a date on here. Nope. Whoa. I Check drew that, that out. Yeah. So this was my mom had these things called like embroidery markers. It was like a tube of paint kind of with like a ballpoint fixture and because somehow i couldn't figure out that you could buy a kiss shirt at the mall i had to, i may made my own rock and roll over t-shirt that's badass man yeah i mean i'm stoked i have it and luckily one of my friends saved a bunch of my other stuff so i know it's around somewhere i really think and i would encourage you i don't know how much you like your gear and stuff that, that from the people that you do or maybe if you have other stuff I think you like an art show. Your stuff would be fucking rad, man. I just yeah, I'd like to. Uh, I would. I'm encouraging you. I'm challenging you because I'll come to if it's in L.A. I'll I'll make the five hour drive for that. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I already have it all planned out. I have a uh, my my concept is called um st- uh, sketch to stage. Oh, okay. I'd show the sketches and then I'd show the costume. Yeah. And then like a couple of photos, you know, real high concept stuff. But yeah, it would it would be awesome. The the problem though with that whole scenario is I don't own like anything. Right. I don't own any of these costumes. Like the most stuff I have is like um some Clive Barker stuff I did, and then some like Dimu Borgia helmet and props and some other stuff. But I mean, that's it. Like I'd have to like remake stuff, like i don't yeah i would need someone to help me who oh never mind i just remember my friend beth actually is a manager at a place that they professionally do the archives for rock bands that's gnarly yeah i should hit her up and see who she's repping because maybe i can pull stuff from the archives and i think i know vince neal stuff has ended up like all over the place because someone so showed me a um, a picture of a pair of pants that I made for Vince that are in like Indonesia and at the hard rock. And yeah. the last case. <laughs> Once again, tell your 18 year old that, Hey, this work you're going to do, it's going to be in Indonesia on display, man. So chill the yeah. fuck out. <laughs> oh man. When the, uh, the, when the hard rock was in Vegas, we had a whole dis- Steven Tyler display, like at the front walkway of the hard rock hotel. Yeah. That was a trip. Cause when I was growing up, in the 70s, we would go to the roller rink and look at the girls. And, and I remember because that's when Walk This Way came out. And, and all, yeah, I was just like, and then I ended up working for Steven Tyler. And, you know, I was like that close from his face because he, he talks to you like really, he gets really close to you. Like when he's like gets excited. Yeah. So you're just like, whoa, it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot to deal with because you're like. That's fucking Steven Tyler. He's like, <laughs> that close to me. <laughs> Todd, he, let me tell you. He's like, Junker, all right. Like, he's, yeah, he's loud and, yeah, he's awesome to work with until he he's, gets mad at you and then fucking watch out. Oh, Lord. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, w- w- the the other podcast, I had tried to speak with him on that one, too, because I kind of, you know, wanted a, a guy that's, had that interesting cycle of sobriety and everything else. I was like, okay, this will be gnarly. You know, this will, this will get some people's attention that maybe you're still struggling with this disease to get some help. So, right. uh, but I've, but I've heard that about him, that it's, he's kind of like, yeah. Until it hits a little threshold and it's like, uh Oh yeah. Yeah. We all have our, you know, stuff. Uh huh. You know, the the thing that's interesting, the like the tie in back to Motley Crue is when at least this is what I perceive it as I was hanging out with Steven and uh, and I think I met Dr. Feelgood. The doctor came in with the fuck the the case, oh, anything shit. you wanted, the doctor feel good. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's what I like to pretend. I don't know. Like, I, I, I'd have to ask Vince like more about like break it down and figure out who wrote the song i mean did vince write that or did nikki write it right i just remember being like uh b12 shot i mean <laughs> anything else that's in that case i'm like uh-uh no 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 
Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's it's gnarly. Yeah, you'll definitely have to come back on. We'll uh, get Jesse in there. Or some uh, um, like another guy that's really gnarly lives in L.A. Uh, comic book writer, and he also was the writer of that unauthorized play, um, Crude. Uh, so he's he's a really switched on cat as well that could get into talking about this stuff from a totally different oh, perspective. Yeah, because I'm gonna people are kind of saying they like the inside baseball stuff. That's why I really want to talk with you. In addition to you, just seem cool as hell. So selfishly, oh, I, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't believe you know it's just it's a trip. So like, I'll I'll tell anybody anything they want to know about because I'm still like fascinated by the whole thing myself you know i don't I'm not uh uh i'm i wouldn't say that i'm you know jaded but but they i think most of it's been great like yeah. i've had very few like really bad experiences dealing with you know people like steven T tyler and the guys in motley crew they've literally literally been famous since the time they could barely drive you know right i'm like so i don't know what that does to you but they all they have manners, you know, they're not animals, yeah. not anymore, at least. <laughs> right. We didn't yeah. mean them at that period. Thank goodness. Right. No, I, I mean, I, uh, I've met the full band. Like I saw them in Vegas on the red, white and crew tour, met all the guys, um, interviewed them all at different times and, and it all been totally cool and uh yeah you know i have to say mick mars no insult to anybody else but uh, i'm a huge i'm a fan of all of them of course but mick's like my dude and when i interviewed him and i gotta tell him hey uh you're my jeff beck uh it went from a you get a 10 minute interview to i got a whole hour with him and he was the sweetest nicest yeah. kindest most intelligent just wonderful person and yeah. That was like the coolest experience. That's one of those. Go back and tell your tell your seven, eight year old self you're going to talk to Mick Mars. So chill Mick, the fuck out. Yeah, because, man, you know, he's operating on a whole different level, dude. Like all the challenges that he has, you know, with his spine and all that stuff. Yeah. And and I just remember <laughs> my favorite Mick Mars quote. And they're, it's the only one I didn't. I only worked for him maybe a couple times. Although I think he's wearing our pants still on this tour. But he's, I was like talking to him about, you know, this and that. He's like, yeah, he's like, uh, you know, man, just let the, you know, just let the, the coat do the rocking. You know, that was what he told me. I was like, okay, whatever that means. <laughs> All right. The coat's going to do the rocking and you're going to do the, whatever you're going to do. Okay. Uh, that's that was awesome. Badass. Fucking awesome. Hell yeah. Well, Todd, I know that you got something else you got to get on to, man. I could ask forever. You even dropped Clive Barker in there. And now I'm going to have yeah. to, <laughs> we're going to have to talk about that some other time. Cause, uh, Hey, you're, uh, you're speaking my language. I know they're doing a new pinhead movie that I think is going to be on Hulu. So I'm like, yeah, someone just that. told me about that. I don't, I don't know if Clive directed it, but, um, yeah. Anytime you want to do something else and yeah, hit me up. Please. Yeah. I, I would love to have you on the knocking doors down podcast for sure. Rad. Yeah. Cool. Uh, if people want to know more about, uh, about you find your, your gear and everything else, how can they do that? Todd? I think the best is probably like at junker designs on uh, Instagram and there's a link to the store there. And I think Instagram is where I'm going to jump off and do my, my live feed uh, on there. And, and uh, it's probably like the most active and, you know, anyone has any questions, like that's what we do. Like for the next hour, like people are just kind of asking me shit and we're just yeah. cutting it up. No, I've had many of the crew heads say they find that really cool that you do that. Oh, really? Yeah, really? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah because I... it's like there's no, you know, there's. Yeah. What am I trying to say? Uh, there's no, there's no, there should be no man behind the curtain, you know, right. like I'm super, super fucking lucky that I got to do all this stuff with bands that I really like, especially Motley Crue. And so, yeah, I'll talk about it as much as anyone wants to hear about it. No problem. Yeah. Keep it up. Cause I jump on there. You've hopped up. You've done it a few times when I'm at work and it's a frustrating day. So I'll just set the phone up and just listen. It's kind of, okay. Give me a little bit of a break from this. Shit. Oh, right on. Cool. All right, my brother. I appreciate you so very much. 
No problem. Appreciate you too. Talk soon. Thank you, uh, fellow crew head, for listening to the podcast again, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Hit that subscribe button. Share, share with the fellow crew head. Uh, all the social medias are at Crewcast. And on that note, crew heads are best. Fuck the rest.